Hi there, welcome to Silicon Mind. I'm Basil and this is the very first episode of my channel. Here we'll be discussing all things related to artificial intelligence. AI has been making massive strides over the last couple of decades, but only recently has it become somewhat of a household name where not a day passes by when we don't hear the phrase AI or artificial intelligence in the news. Together with the news, we hear about more and more tools that are popping out to the market. Tools such as ChatGPT, DALI, Llama2, Stable Diffusion, just to name a few. Now the sheer number of all those tools might be a little daunting at times. That's why I decided to start this channel where we'll have a look at those tools, see how they work, see how easy they are to set up and have a look at a couple of real life scenarios of using them. And hopefully you will be able to add some of those to your arsenal of day-to-day -day tools. Because I can assure you that using AI tools at work and at home can really benefit your productivity. Now in the very next episode of Silicon Minds, we will be looking at probably the most commonly used AI tool out there which is, of course, ChatGPT. So we'll have a look at how to set it up, how to start using it, and a couple of tips and tricks on how to make it work for you. On top of those very practical tutorial-styled videos, I will also like to have a look at a couple of other topics related to artificial intelligence. Topics such as the latest trends, a little bit of history, so we'll talk about um, who Alan Turing was and how he has become somewhat of a father figure to artificial intelligence and um, computer science as a whole. We'll look at how Deep Blue, which was a supercomputer built by IBM, managed to win a game against Garry Kasparov in 1997, who at the time was the world champion chess player. We'll look at those topics and a couple of other ones which led us till today where we use artificial intelligence without even knowing about it. We'll also talk about AGI, which is Artificial General Intelligence. We'll discuss if it's potentially going to be our friend or foe, as there are quite a lot of different opinions about that. Hopefully we'll get a couple of interviews in the mix as well with AI tool creators. And we'll dig a little deeper under the hood of what artificial intelligence really is. So expect topics such as data science, machine learning, deep learning, uh, large language models or LLMs, generative AIs, and a lot of other ones out there. Now here's a question I have for you. Are there any topics related to artificial intelligence which you would specifically like to know more about? Or are there any ideas that you've heard about but don't fully understand. Well, if you have a topic like that in mind, please feel free to drop a message in the comment section below and I promise I'll get back to you. And who knows, maybe one of the future episodes of Silicon Mind will be an answer to your question. And since you're already in the comment section below, in order to continue watching, you'll have to scroll all the way up, passing by the subscribe button. So feel free to click that and since this is the first episode of Silicon Mind, you will have the legendary status of an early bird Silicon Mind subscriber. So just letting you know, please don't miss out. All right, but what is artificial intelligence really? Well, let me give you the definition by Oxford Dictionary for that. AI or artificial intelligence is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making and translation between languages. All right, so artificial intelligence is a piece of software or hardware which effectively is built to perform a task which would usually require a human's intelligence to complete. So let's have a look at a couple of examples of AI in everyday life. So one of the simplest examples of AI is right in your email. It's the spam filter function, which most email providers have. We'll have a longer discussion about spam filters later on in the videos. Another very popular example in everyday life are voice assistants, which have become increasingly more popular and reliable um, since 2011 when Apple released Siri to the iPhone. Now if you play chess, or any video game for that matter, everybody who's playing against you, who isn't your friend or someone you're playing online with, is an AI bot. 
So again, it's a piece of software which is taught to specifically either help you or, or kill you in, in most cases. What about if you go on specific websites? You'll often see little chat box in the bottom right corner of the page, which asks you if you need any help or how you're doing today. Now in 99% of the cases, they are AI chatbots, which are built to help you find what you're looking for in the website or help you resolve some of your problems. One area that is using a lot more AI tools recently is the automotive industry. If you have a fairly recent car, you might have an image recognition system built into your car, which allows it to determine what road signs you're about to see. That information is then projected onto your infotainment system, letting you know about a potential hazard or limit on your way. Another much more complex piece of AI kit that you'll find in today's cars, or more specifically Tesla's and perhaps a couple of other brands, is Autopilot, which is a feature which enables the car to drive on its own. And that is a lot more complicated than spam filters, I can assure you. The healthcare industry is also becoming more and more reliant on artificial intelligence. A lot of research is being carried out to help determine if, if a patient is showing symptoms of a potential illness. Those techniques enable doctors to predict if their patients are showing signs of potential future health issues. The last industry I'd like to mention here is finance. A lot of hedge funds and other financial institutions heavily rely on algo trading or algorithmic trading, which are algorithms which help predict the most optimal moments to buy or sell certain commodities. A lot of those trading algorithms heavily rely on artificial intelligence. Those algorithms use machine learning to analyze vast amounts of market data, make predictions and execute trades. Now, as great as it sounds, it can lead to disasters. A great example of that is the flash crash of 2010, where a number of different financial institutions with their specific algorithms and platforms have caused a downward spiral where the Dow Jones dropped by over 9% within a couple of minutes because of heavy sell-offs caused by those algorithms. We'll have a deeper look into the world of finance with regards to artificial intelligence in a separate video because I think there's quite a lot to cover and it's a fascinating topic. So now that we've seen a couple of examples of where artificial intelligence is being used, let's see how AI is reached in the first place. There's a number of ways of reaching artificial intelligence. Some of those include neural networks, swarm intelligence, expert systems and genetic algorithms. But the one you probably have heard most about is machine learning. Most AI solutions that we're going to be talking about do rely on machine learning. So let's find out what it actually is. So let's start off with a definition from the Cambridge Dictionary this time. Machine learning is the process of computers changing the way they carry out tasks by learning from new data without a human being needing to give instructions in the form of a program. So basically what that means is instead of writing programs the old-fashioned way where we give specific instructions or an algorithm of completing a task which is predefined before its first run. In the case of machine learning we don't specify the steps and instructions for an algorithm. What we do instead is we feed an algorithm with a whole lot of data depending on the task it's supposed to complete. So it can be either images or audio files or logs or databases. It really depends on the use case you're trying to solve. And then the algorithm grabs all this data and finds common traits in order to find patterns in that data, which will help it solve the underlying issue. So effectively, the more data you provide the algorithm, the better it will get at solving its task. So let's use a little example just to make things a little clearer. Let's imagine we have a problem. We get images from some source, which are either images of bottles or plants. And the goal for the program is to distinguish if the picture is in fact a bottle or a plant. So with traditional ways of programming, we would probably write a whole bunch of code which would find traits of those images which are specific to being a plant or a bottle. Probably the program would work relatively well. However, the problem is 
that if one day somebody showed up and asked us to create an algorithm that distinguishes books from dogs, we would have to write a brand new algorithm specifically for dogs and books. Now, with machine learning, what we would do is create an algorithm that actually learns from input data. The algorithm receives thousands of photos of bottles in different orientations, colors, sizes, etc. And thousands of photos of different plants, trees, flowers, different colors, different sizes, different shapes, etc. While the algorithm learns on this data, it should have some clear image of the difference between those two items. If we input yet another picture of a plant, an image which has not been part of this training data that we used previously, the algorithm should quite capably give us the information whether the object is a plant or a bottle. The good thing about it is that if, again, the same scenario occurred where we had to change what we were trying to distinguish, say this time it would be curtains and televisions, we would just input a whole bunch of photos of curtains and televisions and the same algorithm would help us determine between those two. So that's a very basic example of machine learning. Now let's look at an example from the real world. So remember when I told you about a very basic example of an AI algorithm that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the spam filter? Well, the spam filter doesn't work much differently to the bottle and plant example that I've just given you. In the beginning of its existence, the spam filter is taught based on thousands of emails which are categorized between being spam or non-spam. So the algorithm, similarly to what it did with the bottles and the plants, finds similar traits which distinguish an email from spam. As an example, the algorithm might have realized that emails which are written with very poor grammar or have unknown senders or include mismatched URLs tend to be spam. So then, based on the learnings from thousands of emails, it will decipher that those specific traits mean that the email should be categorized to the spam folder. Now, the great thing about those kind of algorithms is that they continue learning while they're already working for us. So in the case of spam filtering, we still have that little button on our emails, which we can click to report spam. Now, if hundreds of different users report the same kind of emails as spam, and the algorithm realizes a specific new trait that it's never realized before, let's say adult promotional material, it will probably create a new trait, which it will check new incoming emails against. So the next time you get an email with an advert for some sort of dodgy pills, that email will most likely be dropped into the spam folder. So there you go. Now, hopefully you understand how your spam filter works on your email, how machine learning works, what artificial intelligence is, and you subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode where we'll talk about ChatGPT, how to set it up, how to start using it, and how to make it work for you. Stay tuned. See you later.